Cholem Lekim Assalamu alaikum Shalom Alechem The very concept of racial and or ethnic Jewry is part of anti-Semitism. Variations of anti-Semitism would be the sectarian bigotry manifesting politically and or religiously as Islamophobia and Judeophobia, fictional beliefs in Jewish race and or Jewish ethnicity, belief in world conspiracy theories controlled by a Jewish cabal, racial hatred towards people who have a high Muslim population within their regional areas, countries, communities, etc., such as various Arab peoples, the Persian, Iranian peoples, Pakistanis, the peoples of Palestine, peoples of Bangladesh, and of course the racist Serbian nationalist fervor that is targeted against Bosnian Muslims, which to this day they don't even acknowledge the massacre that they did, and not just by the state apparatus, pretty much the entire local population unanimously are bigots. It is possible for an entire group to believe in bigotry if their ideology dictates it, and you will not find this by Muslims. It is not Muslims who universally hate people. And it is not Jewish people, but it is certain types of right-wing Western Christians that do believe this. And Eastern Christians who have taken up a more crusader-like mentality, which is not as common among the Eastern Church, but it can still infect the Eastern Church. Uh, some of us believe that this is rooted in the Gospels itself. I don't particularly take that stance. However, if you do talk about the Book of John, yes, the Book of John is an anti-Semitic text that Christians should remove from their text, and we cannot force that, and any attempts to force that should also be combated at the same time. This gets into one of the reasons why Jewish people are not Muslims, because Muslims believe Jesus is the Messiah, which is one of the most abhorrent beliefs you could have as Jewish, although they don't believe he is the Savior as Christians do. However, again, Jewish people and Muslims have always had a sense of solidarity. Always. That is not to say there hasn't been disagreements between those Jewish and those Muslim, but typically, more than any other two religions, Jewish and Muslim have the most in common. More than any other two religions, the ones that are the most too diametrically opposed to one another is Judaism and Christianity. That doesn't necessarily mean Judaism and Christianity are always enemies with one another. In the large forces of the chauvinistic, social Darwinistic, secular humanist forces, I guess you could say this is where Jewish and and Christian often will find themselves in the same boat together. Also, you know, if it comes to Protestant populism, even Catholics are far better in communication with Jewish people in this sense. So that is anti-Semitism in a nutshell given uh, and some extra commentary and that is how we give some opening to this Jewish people do not support the state of Israel not only do we not support the state of Israel we objected to the very Zionist ideology before anybody else did so anyone who says well the source of Zionism is Judaism or Jewishness, understand that that not only is not correct, the source of Zionism is founded within the Puritan faith of the Protestant movement, of the Puritan faith and the separatists that later founded Plymouth Colony. This would later become the Evangelicals. So Americanism actually is the pretext to Zionism, because Christian Zionism predates Jewish Zionism, and Christian Zionism used to be known as Restorationism, which is a tendency within, again, the Puritans, which was later adopted by other various newer Protestant waves. There is no protocol of the learned elders of Zion. There is only a protocols of the learned elders of the United States of America and Southern Baptist Rockefeller and Bush family and 
Western Christianity pretty much in all of its forms of domination. And yes, the more literate, the Catholic, the more Jewish friendly, typically. This is because education is not a privilege, it is a right. Everything that is being said here, right now, is being said directly against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is not a religion, but a form of bigotry, and against the Southern Baptist powers, the Evangelical powers, and the white Pentecostal powers, along with the Seventh-day Adventists and all the other nasty groups, which are not religions. As in fact, they say that they are relationship, not religion, so therefore they are illegitimate. They do not have apostolic secession, and they today make up the Crusaders, which control the state of Israel. And any notion that APAC is a Jewish lobby uh, is just false. It falls short. Because APAC is controlled by evangelical groups and the Tea Party, and pretty much once again, this goes back to Western Christianity. So before fingers are pointed, believe me, if we point fingers, it will be factual. Now, on January 2nd, sorry, I apologize, January 22nd, 2016, Dr. Abram Weisfeld was filming an overview of the city of Nablus, Palestine, within the West Bank location. Typical Friday day off, beginning of the weekend. One father is repairing a leaky roof with cement, of course, with his son looking on, learning how to do it himself. Over here, the lady putting out the wash on the balcony. This is winter beautiful sunny and warm during the day of course at night that's another matter i believe this is the 22nd of january 2016. have a look up the mountain all those are new buildings hand built up the side of the mountain. With excavations, digging into the edge to make level surfaces to build, oh, what are now 10-story towers without the usual construction towers, working with uh, electric pulleys to bring up the construction material all applied by hand. Interior made of uh, cement and an exterior layer of stone squares cemented into place. Well, the reason why the buildings are going up the side of the mountain rather than expanding the uh, limits of the municipality of Nablus here is because uh, the limits of uh, Sector A imposed themselves upon the uh, demographics here because uh, there are no construction permits allowed by the uh, occupying uh, the military forces of the State of Israel outside of the uh, Sector A, which is very uh, constrained, uh, limited uh, municipal area. Yeah. <laughs> 
there. The buildings have reached the top of the mountain. Over there, there is actually a public park on the edge of the mountain. And on the top is, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, local national bourgeoisie with a beautiful building, actually, dome on top, oriental influence, <coughs> and each side with uh, an Acropolis facade with the uh, Greek influence, which once, once was a uh, occupying power here in uh, Palestine. Palestine seems to be a favorite place to occupy. This is the old city ruins. I don't know if they're used anymore, but they probably are. They're sort of um, attached to the newer buildings. The old city is in the background there, and it's all used. All the narrow streets are filled with little shops, one after the other, which open into a cavern-type boutique or even a little shop uh, manufacturing stuff, like a little factory. There's another uh, video uh, tour with Mustafa Zizi going through the old city, you know, on the uh, 80 Man uh, YouTube channel. So here we have a supplement. Here I'll give you a close-up of the uh, local uh, Green Domed Mosque, uh, which in Arabic is not called a mosque, which in Arabic is called a uh, Jaber. Got it in frame. The way buildings are built here, they're built to last, like a thousand years, two thousand years. The old city there is two thousand years old, built during Roman times. I mean, Roman occupation times. And down the road <coughs> is the uh, bladder refugee camp, which is built over the site of the original town here, which in biblical times was called uh, Sechem, or Session. Oh yes, there's lots of dogs, all of whom live outside. Animals are not allowed inside the house here. A lot of street cats. And they all survived the winter. Here's a, an old uh, television antenna, but of course uh, the satellite disks are omnipresent. Here's the local uh, Golden Dome. It's a replica of the uh, Al-Quds uh, Dome of the Rock. See how sunny it is. It's incredible and warm. The sun, of course, is much warmer than it used to be with the global warming.
the lady putting out the wash there again, and uh, here's a very old building covered in uh, those little yellow flowers. Next to the satellite dishes, of course, showing what's called uh, uneven and combined development which for sure is operative here. And in relation to this, uh, I now bring you to an event of interviewing uh, in East Jerusalem. In East Jerusalem, Dr. Arbam Weisfeld bears witness to a testimony with uh, Mr. Jaffer of an expelled family in Palestine, East Jerusalem. This is also sometime in the year of 2016, I believe in the month of January, I think. The year of 2016. Okay, now come closer so the microphone picks up, you know, the information. Okay, but I want to go both of your heads as well, so can you sit yes. a little closer? Very good. Great. So here we are at uh, Nabus and uh, Dalman Streets at a vigil in support of the Palestinian homes that are threatened with being taken over by some uh, illegal court actions uh, which are claiming that there was uh, a couple of uh, homes here that used to be lived in by Sephardic Jewish uh, people a long time ago and they're using this as an excuse to take over your home. So, is this the uh, situation, uh, this is the condition that you find yourself in now? Um, okay. Um, the, the issue of my neighborhood started at 1948, when Israel start, uh, started the first war between the Arab and Israel. And uh, as you know, Israel or uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, terrorism uh, like uh, Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel at 1976 or 7, uh, they killed a lot of people uh, from uh, uh, Palestine and they refugees, the people, uh, or they, uh, they make them to, to through to uh, Jordan or Syria or Lebanon, as you know, where uh, uh, the refugees uh, come in, in, uh, in that uh, countries. Um, the Palestinian families here in Sheikh Jarrah, all of them is uh, refugees, people from uh, 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 the land in uh, 1948, I mean the land of Palestine. Um, the United Nations decided to build a new neighborhood for the uh, refugees people uh, uh, just to help uh, uh, the people, the Palestinian people. At 1952, they end to build 28 uh, houses and they make agreement with uh, the Palestinian families, um, with the Jordanian government. It means there is three sides. It's the Jordanian government and the United Nations and the Arab uh, or Palestinian families. They make exchange with the United Nations to, uh, uh, to exchange uh, the refugee card with that apartment, a small apartment. It was only seven by seven meters. At 1973, when Israel annexed it, East Jerusalem to West Jerusalem, and they uh, advertise that there is no East and West, it's only one Jerusalem, or the big Jerusalem. The first settlers association claimed that land, it's belonged to them. After four years in the Israeli court, they lose the case because they don't have any document uh, to prove them on on the land. They sold the area. 
they sold um, maybe the right of the area to another settlers association. At 2006, the Israeli court decided that for both there is no enough document to prove the all on the land, so they keep the situation without any change. The Israeli um, the, the, the settlers decided to solve the rights again to another settlers association at 2006. The situation in the region allowed to Israel to kill, to transfer, to do anything against the Palestinian community, and nobody uh, check uh, the, this small state. Because we talk about Israel, and it's the uh, uh, full right of Israel to defend itself. But I want to ask the, the, uh, 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 the world, all of the world, to defend itself, it's mean to transfer the Palestinian people, to transfer the Palestinian community, specifically in East Jerusalem? No. We don't, we don't agree with Israel because we know it's our full right to be here. And we're talking now about all of uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the Palestinian territory. Even the Palestinian uh, leader, I mean Abu Mazen and Mr. Yasser Arafat, agree to separate the state, I mean Palestine, for uh, two states, but Israel wants to Judaize the state. To Judaize the state, it means they want to transfer all of the Palestinian community from East Jerusalem. Now we are 360 uh, uh, people, and they want to transfer all of us. Uh, it's, uh, Israel do doesn't uh, 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 care where we have to go, to Jordan, maybe to Iraq or to Egypt. Really, they, they don't care. But at 2008, they uh, uh, succeed to evict to evict the first family um, after 10 days. Uh, uh, the guy died because he cannot uh, uh, stand the suppression. And at 2009, uh, the Israeli court decided to evacuate us. I mean, they want to evacuate 37 people from my family and 17 people from the other family in Sheikh Jarrah. At 2000, the 2nd of uh, 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 August 2009, they came at 4.50 in the morning with all of, I think, all of the uh, Israeli uh, 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 military to evacuate my family and they, they don't try to, to provide anything because the plan is to throw the families to Ramallah or uh, 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 any place of the uh, Palestinian Authority. At the day one, we started to, to demonstrate down there in front of my house and uh, uh, we, we stayed there for seven months in small tent in the front of my house. But the Israeli government, the municipality uh, of Jerusalem, uh, they don't like it to, uh, um, to protest against the, uh, uh, the wall or uh, the water or uh, um, uh, uh, our mask, Al-Aqsa mask, <coughs> sorry, they don't like it. They took the tent 17 times. Every time uh, uh, they, they took the, uh, the tent, they was arrested some people from my family. Also the fees. 
But after seven months, we cannot stay here because the weather, it started to, to uh, rain, and it was very difficult for us because there's uh, children and uh, they, they start to be uh, sick. Okay. Uh, this demonstration started uh, six uh, years ago, and we will continue to struggle against the apartheid of the state uh, to protest against the wall, the water, uh, the services of uh, uh, the municipality office of Jerusalem. They just know how to collect your money and they don't care for where you have to get it. And uh, the situation really in East Jerusalem very, very bad. The situation going from bad to worse, I mean, because Israel just push and push with non-stop against the Palestinian community. We hope that all of the world can help us to return my, my family back to my house and the other families in Sheikh Jarrah and to end the occupation. I want to say something for all of the world. If is it in the USA or Canada or France or Britain, in Palestine, if there is no peace, it means no peace in all of the world. Because here, Palestine is the center of uh, the peace. And uh, 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 all we want is only peace. We don't want or we don't need more wars. It's enough. The, the, the first war in uh, 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 1948, 67, uh, 73, 82, 2000, 2002, 2004, 2006, 2008, 12, and uh, 40. All of these wars, Israel started to attack. Actually, who want this war? It's Israel. Maybe they want to, to, to see more uh, bloods in the area. And the Israeli government should know that if there is no peace in my house, in my country, in my uh, neighborhood, there is no peace in all of the uh, places, all, all of uh, uh, the, uh, the world, uh, around the world, I want to say. Yeah, but, okay, this is the, this is the situation, and uh, I hope that Israel can understand that enough for wars. Yeah. Can I ask you one question? Yeah. Can you tell the, the public how long your family lived in the house? Uh, actually, uh, we lived in the house uh, since 1952 till 2009. From 1952 till 1973, there is no body claim that my house or it's my land or the, you you sit here on my land and if you want to 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 pay rent or something like this nobody because the plan of israel is to transfer the palestinian people they came with the order evictions and they implemented that and where did your family come from in 1952? Yeah, my 1948. In, yeah, 1948. Yes. Remember? Yes. Yeah. My family came from Sarafand. In Sarafand, my family, we have a, a, we had a, a, a 18 dunams of citrus. It's mean my family. It's not poor family. There was a very rich family. The Jewish came and took all of the land and the money and you know uh, because uh, the, the Arab armies they said uh, you can go out from the country for one week or two weeks 
we want to end the Jewish or the case of the Jewish and you come back to your house. You mean the Jewish Zionists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's the Zionism or uh, the, the Jewish, it's not uh, very important, you know, because um, if we're talking about the Jewish or the Jewish Zionism, it's really uh, uh, the same body. Yeah, it's not it's here. Not, it is yes. Now. Yeah. Um, Sefran, where your family originally came from, where you had the uh, we had the citrus farm, the twenty dunams, eighteen, eighteen dunams. Yes. Where? How far away is that? Where um, is that located? It's only 45, 47 kilometers from Jerusalem. Ah. It's beside uh, Lod. Be oh, next to Lod. Yeah. Yes. Now, if you went to court and asked for your land back, what would happen? Uh, my father tried to, to claim in the Israeli courts, I want my land back. You know, the, the, the Israeli court, they just he refused to take the file from my father or the claim from my father. And they said, if you want your land, it's me in Israel out and you want to back to your land. Yeah. yeah so they refused to accept uh, yeah. your legal motion. Yeah. But that's not legal. Y you know. Yeah, that's the way it is. I understand. Yeah. Okay, we'll tell everybody about this. Then. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, shukran. A growing trend occurs among communists to seek aid in explaining why Zionism is imperialism, not liberation. However, anarcho-collectivists, Trotskyists, anarcho-communists, and anarcho-syndicalists typically are less involved with pro-Palestinian activism. It is, ironically, the Marxist-Leninist, Marxist-Leninist Maoists and Maoist third worldists who typically care about pro-Palestinian activism. Because of this, Dr. Weisfeld has presented questions to Marxist-Leninist, Marxist-Leninist Maoists and Maoist third worldists. Can Marxist-Leninists, Marxist-Leninist Maoists and Maoist third worldists recognize the Jewish people as a national minority? Are the Jewish people considered to be subject to racism in the form of anti-Semitism? Is there a possible alliance of the Jewish people in a united front of oppressed nationalities apart from an alliance with some Jewish people? Are national oppression and class oppression related, and how? How is Zionism to be considered in class and revolutionary terms? Is Zionism racism? Is the State of Israel Jewish or Zionist? Is a united front a predecessor to a constitutional assembly? What is the purpose of a party formation, and is it more important than a united front? Now, it is unfortunate that Mr. Jaffer has a hard time seeing the difference between Jewish and Zionist. However, more than ever, Palestinians are seeing the difference thanks to Dr. Weisfeld and the growing outreach of the Naturia Carter rabbis, several of whom are Yiddish and Arabic-speaking Jewish Palestinians. For those of us who are very hurt by people not seeing the difference between Judaism, Jewishness, and Zionism, fascism, well, it's important to keep in mind that we need to stop tolerating the Zionists. The f more and more s a certain amount of us are tolerating Zionism, despite disagreements towards it, the more we are going to be set up as the ultimate scapegoats. We had a very close call where they tried to make BDS illegal, and everybody was saying that this was a Jewish conspiracy. This is what happens when we don't do enough to oppose it. The privilege of the Jewish people in the United States of America is coming to an end. We need to recognize this. And we will be accountable for not speaking out when we know that we oppose Zionism. It's not part of our religion. It's not part of our culture. There's nothing in Judaism, Jewishness, Torah culture, 
uh, the covenantal faith of, 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 of the laws handed to us on Sinai, none of that whatsoever has any connection to Zionism. And we do know that. Those of us who actually are brought up in Judaism and any sense of Torah culture in any way fully understand that Zionism is epithetical to being Jewish. But we need to do more about this. We cannot just trust the Nitria Carter rabbis to always take care of it, because although they should, and they do, it is up to the rest of us to also fall in suit with them. And that is why the Bundist movement is so precisely repressed. And despite repression, we continue to gain popularity. It is not enough to be part of Jewish Voice for Peace. It is not enough to simply oppose the occupation. All concepts of a two-state solution have been destroyed. Palestinian right of return must be ensured, and an end to the folly that is the so-called Zionist you know, right of return, their right of return, must be ended. A full restoration of Palestine must be brought forth, and those that refer to themselves as Israeli must cease to call themselves Israeli. Now, this next clip is from the PBS NewsHour. It is called, How the Pentagon Plans to Fund Trump's Border Wall as House Tries to Block It. This was published on February 22nd of 2019. Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives are set to try to terminate President Trump's national emergency declaration. It would divert Pentagon funds to build a southern border wall. But Democrats introduced a resolution today to block the move. At the White House, the president promised to veto any measure passed by Congress to block his emergency declaration. Will I veto it? 100 percent. 100 percent. And I don't think it survives a veto. We have too many smart people that want border security, so I can't imagine it could survive a veto. But I will veto it, yes. Later, in a visit to Laredo, Texas, Speaker Nancy Pelosi said there is no national emergency and that Mr. Trump created a crisis. We will be fighting him on this usurp usurping of power, of, of uh, violating the Constitution of the United States in the Congress, in the courts, and with the American people. So this is a path I would not recommend he go down. I don't expect him to sign it, but I do expect us to send it. Meanwhile, Pentagon officials brief congressional staffers today on how they might implement the president's order. Lisa Desjardins spent part of the day, of her day, at the Pentagon, and she joins me now. So, Lisa, what are you learning about when the Pentagon plans to try to implement what the president wants? I spoke to the same senior Pentagon officials who briefed Congress. They told me this. Right now, they are assessing exactly what projects that are needed at the border. They're working with the Department of Homeland Security on that. They think within weeks they will have that list. Then, Judy, to my question about timing, they said they think within months they hope to be ready through an expedited process to begin some construction. So if they're going to take this money and use it uh, to build a border wall, where is it coming from? Well, there are two large parts from the Department of Defense. One has to deal with how they fight drug trafficking, and, and that sort of is nebulous. We're going to have to watch that closely. The other is more specific. It deals with military construction projects that have been funded but have not yet begun. Now, Judy, look at this. I was able to obtain a list of some 400 projects that meet that description. This is a very large universe. Not all of these will be chosen. How, and the, when we asked DOD today over how they're narrowing this universe of what projects they would essentially delay or cancel, they told me this. Look at these factors. First, they said there is one pot they will not use that is funding for military housing, which has been in the headlines because obviously there is some substandard housing that needs repair. Also, because they won't use that, they could, however, use funds for things like schools, hospitals, many other facilities, things that are popular. Now, looking at this list, I crunched the numbers, the states that have the most numbers of projects on it, California, Maryland, Alaska, and North Carolina, red and blue states alike. And finally, Lisa, as we reported, the House is expected planning to vote on this to block what the president's trying to do with this emergency declaration. Assuming they do, which is expected, Democratic majority, what happens next? Right. That will pass easily Tuesday is what we expect in the House. Then, Judy, under the special provision triggered by the national emergency, this resolution goes straight to the Senate, and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell must hold a vote within 18 days. 
It is expected to pass there. It does need Republican votes, but already we know a few Republican senators pushing back on the national emergency. Judy, the question in both chambers is, once it gets through Congress, as we expect, is there enough support to override a veto? A lot of pressure on Republicans over this. We're going to watch very carefully. Fascinating. Lisa Desjardins, thank you for your reporting. Interesting how Democrats say they are against Trump's wall. Even though Democrats made clear in the past how much they wanted to have a wall built around Mexico. Hillary Clinton was herself in favor of such a wall. Then Trump made the wall part of his, cam his campaign. And then Hillary opposes him. Then Netanyahu praises him. It, it, it is interesting how much America and Israel are more or less the same country. Well, next up here, I bring you to another PBS NewsHour clip. Uh, it's titled, At U.S.-Mexico Border, a Tribal Nation Fights Wall That Would Divide Them. Uh, this was published on January 13th, 2019. When President Trump visited Texas and the U.S.-Mexico border last week, he continued to double down on his campaign promise to erect a wall along the border. Funding for the wall has divided the administration and lawmakers and has driven a partial government shutdown into its fourth week. But the wall proposal has also divided a different nation, the Tohono O'odham Nation in Arizona, a Native American tribe whose territory straddles the border in both Mexico and the U.S. and has existed long before either country was on the map. News Hour Weekend Special Correspondent Christopher Livesay has the story. The Arizona desert is a breathtaking, albeit unforgiving, environment. The state shares nearly 400 miles of border with Mexico, and much of the area is inhabited by an ancient and little-known Native American tribe. As the national battle over a border wall continues, if plans for a wall do get approved, it will have to get through the Tohono O'odham Nation and their land. It's an area roughly the size of the state of Connecticut that includes more than 60 miles of the U.S.-Mexico border. Verlin Jose is the vice chairman of the Tahana Atom Nation. To put a border wall here, it would be detrimental to our people. It would have a psychological effect. It would have an emotional effect. I think you wouldn't like it if I built a wall right through your home. This is our traditional homelands. Like most Native American tribes, the Tahana Atom are U.S. citizens with a self-governed reservation. But unlike most tribes, it has members living in both the U.S. and Mexico. According to tribal administration, roughly 32,000 live in the U.S., while 2,000 members live in Mexico. We've never crossed the border. The border crossed us. We see just another obstacle in our path to go visit family, to go visit friends to go to sacred sites in Mexico. We feel betrayed back for 160 years. When this international boundary was created without any consent or in any discussion. He's referring to the Gadsden Purchase of 1854 and an agreement between the U.S. and Mexico over where to draw the border, right through Tahana Atom land. You have to understand the history of indigenous people in this country. April Ignacio is a single mother of five who lives on the U.S. side. She says the wall would interrupt the free flow of wildlife, as well as disrupt sacred native rituals celebrating their communion with the land. Ignacio also points out that her tribe already compromised when the U.S. government built a fence on their land, and she says that's more than enough. You've taken the land. You've taken the majority of the water and our resources and the minerals. What more, do, what more do Indian tribes have to compromise? Unlike their ancestors, the Tahana Atam of today can no longer cross the border wherever they please. They have to go through specific entry points. The Tahana Atam are the only people allowed to cross through gates such as these on the Mexico-U.S. border. But some border patrols say that members of the Tahana Atam Nation are abusing that privilege and making big money for the Mexican drug cartels in the process. I've been working out for, for a long time, and we've arrested a lot of individuals on the reservation that have been involved in smuggling. Art Del Cueto is the vice president of the National Border Patrol Union and an agent himself patrolling Tahana Atam land. 
Del Cueto says some tribal members have been convicted for running drugs. It's a lucrative business, made even more attractive because of the high rates of unemployment and poverty on the reservation. Del Cueto says tribal leadership could do more to help stop the smuggling. I don't think they're doing enough. I think they're, they're, they're obviously aware that there's people <clears throat> that live on the nation that smuggle drugs. Some illegal drug traffic occurs in places like this, outside official border ports of entry. The Tucson area, which includes the Tahana Atom Nation, accounts for nearly 60% of that kind of drug traffic. But to be clear, that's not where most illegal drugs are confiscated. A recent Drug Enforcement Agency report said most drugs are found in vehicles attempting to drive through official U.S. ports of entry. However, many people we spoke with, including April Ignacio, think focusing on how drugs enter this country is not addressing the real problem. I live on the nation and we are put in the middle of, you know, the United States' thirst for drugs. Building a wall will not stop drugs from coming. The only thing that's going to stop drugs from coming across is dealing with the drug epidemic here in the country. We drove hundreds of miles along the border during our visit, and the physical barriers varied depending on where we were. Some of it looked like this. Other sections looked like this. And in some cases, no barrier at all. Del Cueto took us to a section of the border where the existing barricade abruptly ends. He says this makes his job, securing the international border between the U.S. and Mexico, nearly impossible. Uh, when you look down here and you see uh, th this type of gaps, and this area where the wall just ends, but the country doesn't end. We need some type of security. A lack of barrier can be due to topography, when a natural boundary, like this mountain peak, has been deemed sufficient. But a lack of border funding is also to blame, according to Del Cueto. And we're extremely grateful to President Trump, and we fully support what he is doing to take care of our nation's borders, to take care of the future of this United States. He's an outspoken advocate of the border wall. Here he is speaking beside President Trump at the White House. Del Cueto, an American citizen born in Mexico, came to the U.S. legally when he was four years old. Like the rest of his Border Patrol colleagues, Del Cueto isn't getting a paycheck because of the government shutdown. However, he says he's willing to work without pay if it will help get the wall built. They, they want to blame President Trump for the shutdown. We don't see it that way. We see it as we want border security. That's all we're asking for. We drove to the far northern end of the Tejana Autumn Territory, some 100 miles from Mexico. It borders on Pinal County, Arizona, where Lieutenant Chris LaPree heads the anti-smuggling unit at the sheriff's office. As a state officer, he has limited jurisdiction south of here on tribal land. He says this mile marker, number 158 off of Interstate 8, is a known drop-off point just outside tribal land where traffickers from Mexico hand off drugs to be distributed in the U.S. When we arrive, Lapree spots water bottles and what are known as sneaky feet, carpet-soled shoes that don't leave footprints. Yeah. So this tells me that these, are, these guys might have been packing dope because the, the blankets are all the same. So usually with immigrants that come across, you get personal items, clothing uh. that's individual or unique to the individual. And here we have a group of stuff that's it's all, all uniform. It's exactly. as if they were standard issue. Yes. That's and really the interesting. The backpacks are all the same. Right. So you and your department, I mean, you're really the last line of defense. Yes. So brazen are the Mexican drug cartels. Lapree says they even have their own religious shrine right here in Arizona. Have you ever seen this lit up? Yes, I have uh, quite a few times. And it's either lit or not. And depending on which one is going on is depending if the um, smugglers know we're in the area or if we're not in the area. So they're sending a signal. This is a lighthouse, effectively. Exactly. Why don't you take it down? Well, number one, it's on uh, reservation. So we would, we're actually, we would be considered trespassing and, and it's actually a crime because it's reservation land. Number two, um, certain things that it represents allows us uh, law enforcement intelligence. Uh, so it's useful to you in a yes, way. Yes, absolutely. Lapree says a wall would help control the tribal area he has little jurisdiction over. It's an opinion shared by Trump supporters who live near the border, like Jim Boaz. It's time to do something and, and get serious about it. Friends of mine that uh, 
live along that border. Ranchers have had the illegal problem for years. According to Customs and Border Protection, the number of undocumented immigrants apprehended at the border has actually been dropping for years. It's gone from 1.6 million people in the early 2000s to roughly 300,000 in 2017. Even so, everyone we spoke to agrees the border needs to be controlled. Some just think there are better ways than building a wall. If you go to the expense to build something fixed that's that permanent, they're innovative. They'll find a way around it, either under it or over it. So that's not the answer. Rodney Irby is the assistant chief of police in the Tahana Autumn Nation. There should be a concentrated effort on addressing uh, any threats that, the, that a border might pose. But I think it needs to be a reasonable and, and, and modern uh, approach to it, maybe, maybe a 21st century approach. Irby points to technology like sensors and surveillance towers as better alternatives to a wall. There is technology. There's plans on the nation for technology, integrated fixed towers, and th those have proven effective because they will detect ultralight aircraft, you know, if they are, were to fly over the border. Even without a wall, there's already palpable tension between Border Patrol and the Tahana Autumn people. I would compare the Border Patrol to the Gestapo. Francisco Valenzuela is a member of the Tahana Autumn tribe and a rancher. He says he's been harassed repeatedly by Border Patrol agents. Every time I come down here, I experience something. Like what? Well, literally being stopped and being searched and uh, point, point the guns at you. So Put you've had hands guns up. drawn at you? Oh yeah, definitely. Tribe members say harassment from Border Patrol agents is routine. April Ignacio recounts her experience. You know, living in the United States and having to go through checkpoints or, or, or wondering if this Border Patrol agent who's pulling you over is going to cut you out of your seat belt or if you're going to be okay. It's a type of psychological, um, emotional trauma that we're dealing with that no one's talking about. What everyone is talking about is the political standoff over a border wall. But for Verlin Jose and his tribe, it's more than just political. It makes me feel that someone will grab a knife and cut across my heart. It is my responsibility to protect this and make sure that a wall is not built on the Tonal Automation. Now, we the Jewish people know and we understand that there is no such thing as a Jewish race, that there is no such thing as a Jewish ethnicity. The Jewish nation is a cultural, religious collective of peoplehood. Even the most non-observant member of Jewry has some Judaism. The Bundist movement accepts both the observant and the non-observant, yet we reject assimilated Jewry. Particularly, I'm referring to assimilated Jewry that rejects the Torah culture, that Jewishness itself is based upon. Even the most secular members of Jewry are founded upon our Torah culture. The assessment that the Bundist movement has to make, because we take the cultural religious stance against the state of Israel, as does Natari Karta, but because we are political, we have to take that, we are in, put in the position where we have to take that a step further. We must therefore understand that if we do not recognize the liberation for the indigenous natives of the American continent, that we become hypocrites. Because it is wrong to say, well, we support the Palestinians against fake Israel, but we don't really care too much about the Native American peoples on the continent. We would like to preserve the United States of America. Um, no, 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 no. In fact, that is why, because of the way that Israel is intertwined with the United States of America, we will not be dealing with federal elections or state elections, and we will strategize and debate as to what our approach will be with city elections, and it's probably going to be mostly a hands-off policy. We're going straight into the civic societies, we're going straight into the community organizations, we are going through grassroots operations, but we're also providing a vanguard system because we cannot afford ignorant Jewry to try to impress itself upon educated Jewry. Now, we are educated, and we seek to educate others, and we will win them over because we're already doing so. And 
to safeguard direct democracy, where we can live peacefully among the indigenous of this continent, we must understand that we have to have a safety wall, not a literal one, a safety uh, barricade against the apparitions of the state and the market. We need to understand that our loyalty on this continent must be to the indigenous and not to the United States of America. Now, the Terry Carta, the way that they interpret it is on them, and we do not condemn them for such, as they are only a religious group. We are a political group as well. So, understand that if we are to do this, we must do it in a certain fashion. As we have discussed between myself and Donna Newman and various conversations that I have had with Dr. Weisfeld, which we're still in the works of figuring this out, and um, now that there's collaboration, further collaboration going on between Donna Newman and Dr. Weisfeld, they've both been very busy, but as I understand it, they are now collaborating together more themselves uh, without me mediating, which they never needed me to mediate, honestly. Um, Donna Newman has been away from computers because of reasons that are not to be discussed, but I will also say that anybody who wants to see or hear Donna Newman on YouTube with me, I mean, I encourage that as well, but the last time that was even briefly attempted on a different channel, uh, the video was erased by Donna herself because she was tired of the criticisms that people were making towards her voice. Uh, the joke going that she sounds like the nanny named Fran. Um, I, uh, I was appalled by this as well, and I can understand the trauma of people making fun of her voice. But I mean, people heckle her in public over it. It's, be it's becoming rather uh, shocking. As now, it's not just, you know, pointing and verbal harassment, but this is going, this is now jumping to physical harassment. Because if you think that there's no such thing as uh, racism towards the Ashkenazim, you are an idiot. So, the way that it works is this. There's the United States of America. We give no acknowledgments whatsoever. We will give credit to someone like Bernie Sanders if he does the right thing, but we're going to not be voting at all, because that is giving legitimacy towards the United States of America, and it's spitting in the face of the native population who does not recognize it. It doesn't matter what assimilated natives believe. We don't associate with the assimilated Native Americans. We associate with the consciously awake Native Americans. Because we are asking them to do the same concerning us, not to associate with the assimilated Jewry, but with the conscious Jewry, which is what we at the Bundist movement promote. So, first off, we do not recognize the United States of America. We barely recognize Canada, and we know that the natives who we have our loyalty towards, as this is their land, we understand that they don't recognize Canada. But the dissolving of Canada it, it takes higher precedence than the dissolving of the Mexican state and the South American states. The dissolving of Canada, New Zealand, and Australia as state colonial structures is secondary to the disillusionment of and the, dis, and, the, and the dissolving of the United States of America. So the first higher priority is with the state of Israel, the United States of America needs to cease to exist as a super state, as a state at all, as a country. The United States of America needs to cease to exist along with the state of Israel. And we need to promote direct democracy. And the return of sovereign rights back to the natives, their holy mountains, their holy places, um, sovereign rights, first sovereign rights over the land must be restored to them. Uh, but the first thing, the first step is getting rid of the United States and the State of Israel. Then we can talk about getting uh, rid of Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And then from there we can talk about overthrowing the Span this various Spanish bourgeoisies over Mexico and the South American states. Part of the strategy of 
ensuring that, though, is supporting the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela and supporting Nicolas Mandora. That's part of that process. And for us here in the United States of America, we look to the Machica movement. Those radical, angry, nonviolent people. We are not nonviolent, but we will not force other groups to not because we will not force the Machica movement to neglect nonviolence. We recognize them as a socialist group. They probably don't use the word socialist. I've never seen them use it. And like us, they reject the term communist. As these the words communist and anarchist in origin are Eurocentric. Socialist, however, by the definition, if you understand word structure, is cor a correct term. And there's got to be more evaluation than that in later videos. But yes, our loyalty here in the United States is to the Machika movement. Who they were all at once would like to see the United States of America, Canada, and the state structures by the Spanish bourgeoisie over the South American continent completely dissolved. And we understand that. But they have to do it from the point of view of the indigenous Mexicans who are aware that they are natives. Now, the Mexican people are indigenous natives of the continent. They are not Latinos and they are not Hispanic. Both mixed blood and full blood, the Mexicans are the Aztec people. They are not, in any way, Spanish. Many of them speak Spanish. However, there are Chinese people on the continent, on the American continents, who speak English. Does that make them Britannia? No. Am I Britannia? No. In fact, actually, funny enough, as I am Sephardi, I really am Latino and Hispanic. How funny is that? Well, I bring you to a video called What is the Machica Movement? It was published on May 8, 2010. However, I'm pretty sure that this was originally filmed on March 20th of 2010. I love my people, the Nicantlaca, the indigenous people of this continent, the full blood and the mixed blood, all of them from the north to the south, from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego. I love who we are as civilizations and cultures, a people of genius, passion, creativity. I love all of who we are, who we were, the whole of our past, the past where we were once a people of civilizations, civilizations going back to 3700 BC. Our first civilization was born in the southern part of this continent, in the Caral Supe area of Peru. Our civilizations were older, centuries older than the civilization of Egypt. We were the first people who approached our creator in a scientific way, a way that was all about loving our creator and not of fearing our Creator. We were also a people who invented original approaches to astronomy, mathematics, writing, calendar making, engineering, architecture, art, education, medicine, agriculture, literature, government, and so much more. All of these great accomplishments are unknown by our people in any real way. Today our people are enslaved to ignorance. We are deeply enslaved to ignorance, and we don't know it. We, every one of us, are culturally, economically, psychologically, and emotionally the slaves of the white race. We have no vision that is real of the beautiful accomplishments of our people. And we have no vision of the liberated potential of our future a future without white people controlling our lives. We don't think of it, we don't visualize it, we can't see a future where white people will no longer be stealing the wealth of our continent and where all of our lands will be ours collectively, all as one nation from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, all of Semanawak as one nation. The very idea of having no Europeans in our lives, 
not controlling our lives scares us. Scares us more than the KKK, more than death, more than cancer, more than violent death. We are good and scared, cowardly scared, because that is how we have been conditioned to fear the white man. This has to change. This lecture is a guidance for that change. This lecture is for those with the intelligence and the courage to change their lives and to help the rest of our people become a people educated in our interests as a liberated Nigantlaka people. In order for us to be liberated, we need to be educated as Nigantlaka, as the indigenous people that we are. In order for us to be educated, we have to learn how to study. But somewhere along the way, we have to learn courage and honor, discipline and dedication, and to have a true love for the idea of an independent Nicantlaca nation free from Europeans. We have been doing the work of the Machica movement since 1992 to confront white supremacy and to provide an education for the liberation of our people. We noticed back then that there was not one organization that was speaking and acting for our people as a Nicantraca people. We created the Machica movement for that purpose. Over the years, we have been viciously and verbally attacked not by the KKK or white supremacists. We have been attacked by the vendidos and the opportunists in our community. We get, we get a lot of 15-year-old vendidos challenging what we do and how we do it. They tell us what to write and what not to write. But we also get ignorant or sloppily educated people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, who also feel more qualified than the Machica movement to define our identity, to define our history, and to say what the future of our people will be or will not be. We have the New Agers and the fundamentalist Christians telling us what our ancestors' theology was all about. And none of them has ever even accomplished 1% of the research work that we have done in the study of our heritage. For the record, this is who we are. This is what we have done. We have built an organization for the educational liberation of our people as Nicantlaca, as a united indigenous people all across this continent. We're all about action and not just talk or intellectualizing or an organization of one member on the internet. We have organized protests against the white supremacy of the Anglos and the white supremacy of Spanish language media. We have organized protests against vendidos like Eddie Olmos and Salma Hayek. We have stopped the production of two major racist films, one on Zapata, starring the Spaniard Antonio Banderas, and the other was a Ron Howard film that was going to glorify Cortez. Both were stopped because of the protests of the Mexica movement. We have organized lectures and campaigns to help our people speak more intelligently about their identity and their heritage. We have built one of the largest libraries that focuses on our Nicantlaca heritage. We have done outreach in our communities, at colleges, at events, at protests, and in neighborhoods all across this continent. We have done one of the largest murals on our heritage anywhere on this planet in East Los Angeles. We have built a website to promote this knowledge, to recruit membership, and to give our people some hope. We have created a YouTube website to disseminate knowledge in the form of video lectures from the sacred archaeological sites of our people and lectures in our community, lectures like today. We have guided our people to understand the importance of our Nahuatl language by providing a series of videos introducing them to the Nahuatl language. And we have provided guidance and collective leadership against colonialism and white supremacy, providing a, view, a future for our people, a vision of our people, free. We have done all of this 
and we challenge anyone to say that they have done even 10% of this. But still, we have people confronting us, stealing our materials and passing them off as theirs, and going on and on about black Israelites and Kennewick men and black Olmecs and Atlantis and energy and harmony and so much more ignorance. So yeah, doing education and liberation work is difficult when our people resist liberation. But why do, why do our people resist? Because Telemundo is telling them that they're Latinos and they're Hispanics. They're being promoted as happy mestizos. They're being promoted as the future white people of America. They're being promoted as anything other than the indigenous people of this land, as the owners of this land. And why? Why? Why is that happening? Because that's in the interest of the white settlers on this continent in order for them to continue maintaining taking the wealth of this continent. Every day we're being robbed and we don't care. But somebody steals your bicycle or your car or your iPod and you're ready to kill. <laughs> yeah. So something has gone really terribly wrong. In order to straighten this all out, we have to educate ourselves. It's not going to probably happen in this generation and maybe not even the next generation, but we got to start somewhere.